Hey, Entrepreneur Nation, welcome back to another episode of Entrepreneur 101. I am Reggie B, and I am your host. And listen, we got a great guest with us today. Eric Grafstrom is joining us from Austin, Texas. Uh, you know, I can say one of my favorite places. I've only been there once, but hey, I loved it while I was there. And let me tell you a little bit about Eric. Eric is a startup coach who has worked with dozens of VC-backed startups. He is the founder of Exit Guide, which is a mergers and acquisition platform for fall or so for, for small Main Street businesses. And and when I found that out, I was pretty excited about that because, like I just said, to Eric, before we started here, you never really hear hear about mergers and acquisitions for small businesses. So I'm excited to learn about that. One thing about Eric is he started his career. <laughs> selling webcasting to people who didn't even have speakers or sound cards. <laughs> and, and that to me, if, if you can do that, this guy can probably sell snow to an Eskimo. So, you know, you may want to stay away from this guy if, if there's not something you're serious about buying. So, um, so with that being said, Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you, Reggie. It's great to be here. Hey, it's great to have you. So, um, so yeah, you know what? Selling, <laughs> selling webcasting to people without speakers, that, that's got to be, uh, you know, a trade secret in its own. And maybe we can get into that. But um, what I want to do, Eric, is maybe, you know, before we get into what got you on your entrepreneurial journey, <clears throat> I may, let, let's back up a little bit. Let, tell me a little bit about, you know, pre-entrepreneur Eric. Where'd you grow up? What sure. were you doing? And what kind of led you down this path? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, look, this is uh, this is not a, a traditional straight and narrow path. Um, you know, I, I, for for those that are out there, as, as you'll learn when when we go into the conversation here, uh, you know, in many respects, I've not been qualified or or trained to do any of the jobs that I've had over the past twenty to twenty five years. And a lot of being an entrepreneur is, you know, a willingness to go figure things out, right, and re and be resourceful. Um, I grew up in the Midwest in the U.S. Uh, from you know, grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, still a, a, a diehard, you know, St. Louis Cardinals. Cardinals fan, Missouri. yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, ended up going to school in in Dallas, Texas, and and uh, uh, it was a journalism major. So you can see all the combinations of things that just lead to uh, doing what I'm doing now. Right. right? Yeah. Uh, and, and you know. Toward the toward the end, I don't know why the light bulb didn't go on. I actually loved writing. I, I was I was good. I I ended up having my own column towards the end of the year where I had a lot of free reign. I'd gone, kind of gone through sports editor and other things, um, but I I was about to graduate. And I just I, I didn't want to necessarily go to move to a small town somewhere and work my way up as, right. as a writer. Right. Uh, and uh, ended up oddly enough uh, in in politics for about a year. And, and worked on a presidential campaign in 1992. So I'm, I'm dating myself here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So some of your listeners, uh, you know, depending on their age, may, <laughs> may know who Ross Perot is. Uh, I worked on his presidential campaign in 1992. And it was a year, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. I can imagine, uh, yeah. Yeah. And and so from that experience, though, uh, I I met a couple of people when the campaign was over. Um, I... I uh, was actually trying to start my own business. It was, it was in what was known then as international callback. Uh, and, you know, it was this weird telephony thing for people to make, you know, international calls overseas by rerouting calls. It was, and it wasn't working out. And I had a friend from the campaign who, who called me up and said, look, I just started this company called AudioNet. Uh, come on down. You know, we're, we're looking to build out a team. And uh, so my entrepreneurial journey was was really kind of falling in, in some respects bass backwards into it. Right. Um, you know, I I I, I thought I, I was going to go into journalism, maybe into law. Uh, you know, came up from a very conservative kind of traditional environment, and you know, was on the pathway to to, to probably you know wear a lot of starch shirts and ties and, <laughs> and go down that path. That's yeah. horrible now, but yeah, uh, yeah that that's that's where it all started, and then you know. Um, I landed in a in a, an amazing opportunity uh, in the mid '90s uh, with uh, with what was then AudioNet. Right. Great. And and so from there, when was it you decided to kind of branch on your own? Because um, I know you worked yeah. with a, a lot of many startup uh, businesses. Yeah. But for yourself, when was it you decided? You know what? I'm going to start my own thing. And what was you know it? I, you know, I, I, I don't know that there was ever a moment other than, um, cause you know, I, and I, and again, I think part of being an entrepreneur is you, you go through periods where, uh, 
you don't want to be an entrepreneur. You're fighting against yourself. <laughs> right. Um, you know, it, 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 and some of us, I, I, I say this jokingly, but it, it is, it's, it's, it's like a disease. You, you just have to go create something. Um, uh, so I did, I, I, I started, you know, back in the days at AudioNet, which later became broadcast.com. So yes, I, I did get a chance to, to work by side of Mark Cuban and right. through that whole experience. Um, you know, one, one of the biggest events that, that we broadcast way back in the day, um, you know, I landed the biggest deal of the company. Um, and, and again, not to, to make myself sound like a, a, an intellectual elitist here, Reggie, but it turned out that biggest event was world championship wrestling. Okay. Um, yeah. It was, it was like, the, you know, we, I, I closed this deal, you know, everybody thought it was crazy, but again, we were this scrappy little startup and we thought, who in the world is going to listen on a 14-4, 28-8 modem to wrestling? <laughs> to wrestling, yeah. And and it, it it just was, it was massive. It was the biggest account for the, the company for a number of years. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, I actually had a chance to go to one of the events in in, in Las Vegas. Uh, but, you know, that, that, that whole thing of starting with this ambiguity, it really was like how do you, how do you explain to people who barely know what the internet is that you can stream something? What is streaming? How does this right, work? I right. can't even listen to a CD on my computer. Yeah, and I think either run away from that because there's not enough structure and resources and support and a roadmap to kind of figure that out, or you run trip to it. And I don't know that at that time. I mean, I was in my mid twenties, newly married. I don't know that I I said this is the life for me, but. I, I, it, it, there was something about that process of some days you had no idea how it was going to unfold. And then the reward of right. seeing the pitch go well, the deal close around something that never existed before was just amazing. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, through that, I had the opportunity to, to work in the UK for Yahoo, I ended up in Silicon Valley. Um, and I think, you know, there was a point where that company, before it really hit that headwinds, Yahoo was still growing. And it was at the time, I mean, maybe 10,000 people, you know, when I joined it, you know, when we were acquired, it, it wasn't nearly that big. Uh, it became difficult to do new things. Okay. And I right. remember there was a day <clears throat> I pulled in the parking garage in Sunnyvale, California, and I didn't want to go in. And I had the job that had you asked me as a kid in college, someday you'll be working in California for this, you know, incredible company, yeah. you know, with a big responsibilities, running business development for a business unit. I probably on paper would have said that sounds impressive and cool. And I was, I was miserable. Right. Um, it was too hard to get things done. It was too hard to, uh, to take chances. Um, I found that I, I was just irritated by the number of times where people who could say no, but couldn't say yes. Right. And I yeah. think that's something a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with, which is you want to constantly run against the wall and ask, well, why not? Why can't it be done? What if we tried a different way? And, uh, you know, so that started me on a, a thought process. And I had two young kids at the time you know, to, to say, okay, what is it that I want to do here? And I left Yahoo and uh, ended up working, you know, across a couple different, and I didn't know the startup world. Like I, I, I was in Silicon Valley, but I was working at this big company. People, this is, you know, back when Yahoo was so hot, everybody kind of came to you to do deals and partnerships. And, you know, if you wore the shirt out on the street, people would stop you and oh, I would love Yahoo. Right. Um, uh, in in you know went in in really at the time was was leveraging my business development skills to be a fractional VP of biz dev across a couple of different startups, and uh, one of them I walked into a board meeting toward the tail end, and I didn't you know I kind of on paper knew what a VC was it was somebody who who financed these things right and one of the partners walked out with me after the meeting I just was there to introduce myself as a guy who was helping, and he started me asking me a bunch of questions. He's like, well, how do you work? I understand you, you're fractional and would you do this and do that? And, and suddenly that feeling started to come back to me of, 
<laughs> you know, making it up as you go. <laughs> yeah. Right? I, yeah. I, you know, yeah. Fake it till you make it. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have good answers, but it certainly didn't stop me from giving them any. Right. And, and he essentially was offering me the opportunity to work across a couple, you know, other startups. And I thought I was, you know, working with this one company until I found a real job. And I think that was, that was the moment it was going from that sitting in the garage, the parking garage to Yahoo to yeah. being frustrated, leaving, and then finding myself in a situation with a lot of ambiguity, a lot of uncertainty, how am I going to pay for my mortgage, my kids, all these right. other things. And then somebody asking me a bunch of questions, which with the same time were both exciting as well as scary. And it was just this endorphin rush. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And, you know, you're not the first uh, guest I've had that have said that, 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 you know, on paper, they had a dream job. Yeah. And they were just tired of it. And, you know, on your point there where, you know, it seems like companies get to a point where they can no longer say yes. I think as a startup, we have nothing to lose, right? We, we've just, it's, you know, go, go for broke or you're broke anyhow. So what the hell does it matter? And sure. I think what happens with a lot of these companies when you start growing and now you got some middle management and some upper management and some customers I think fear, right? As entrepreneurs, when we start, we're a little scared, but we don't really have a lot of skin in the game. And now as you grow this company to a certain point, now it's like, well, shit, what if we do this and the bottom falls out of it? Mm -hmm. And I think that unfortunately, because you look at all these large companies where you know great ideas came from nothing, and now sometimes they're a little afraid to to step outside that comfort zone because yeah, what if? So, um, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, I, I heard this this weekend, and I, it was actually during the PGA Championship, which was was this, this past weekend. Right. You know, I'm a bit of a sports guy, and uh, you hear this with some professional athletes, and I can't remember who it was that that they were. It may have been Brooks Kepka, it may have been someone else, but I've heard this more than one athlete say, which is. I, I found that I was playing not to lose instead of playing to win. Right. And and I think playing not to lose is this, as you say, it's a risk adverse approach yeah. to trying to preserve a business and trying to preserve a cash cow or trying to preserve your job or whatever it may be. Yeah. And when you're an entrepreneur, you sometimes have to say, look, I mean, <laughs> this can't get any worse. Or <laughs> That's right. It's not like I'm throwing away, you know, zero, I'm throwing away zero revenue here. I may as well pivot to this or try yeah. this new idea. Um, I've been hitting the mouth, uh, you know, a bunch of times already, you know, one more punch isn't going to hurt. Exactly. So, you know, it is moving from that traditional environment where, um, you know, sometimes the attitude is let's, let's play to preserve, let's play not to lose versus let's take some, take, take some risks. We may fail, but we can take more risks and keep, at it and find a way to win and, and achieve something that we didn't necessarily expect. Yep. Yeah. And I like how you use that analogy comparing, because I'm a sports guy as well, where you compared, you know, business to sports because, you know, I'm a football guy and I, I have found myself, you know, more recently over the years watching college ball over NFL ball because those guys in my eyes still have that hunger right? Mm -hmm. They made it, you know, from the high school level to the college, but there's still that next step. And to me, you know, those guys are putting on, it's a little different now, I think with NIL where they're getting paid to play. And sometimes maybe, you know, you see some guys sitting out some championship games and stuff like that to, to save their, their stock for, for the draft. But, sure. um, but yeah, when you're, when you're still, you know, growing and hungry, you're willing to take a, a few more chances. So, and, uh, and, and that's what really separates. You look at the guys like a Kobe Bryant or a Michael Jordan in basketball, or even a Tom Brady in football. There's some people who, who man, manage to separate themselves from other great players to generational talent. And how much of that is actually physical gifts versus a mental attitude? Right. You know, why is it somebody with already multiple championships dives on the floor for a ball at the risk of, you know, injuring themselves potentially yeah. for a season or, or longer. And I think it's, it's this mentality of, well, that was yesterday. Right. That was yesterday. Like that championship was last year. Yeah. Like they hit the reset button. Um, and, and so I think that is part of being an entrepreneur. You don't necessarily have to become the Michael Jordan of your industry, but it's that ability to um, have this hunger. Right. Each day is new and you can kind of have a short-term memory about both your losses as well as to a degree your wins and get up and just say, okay, like I want to, I want to do better. I want to strive for more. 
Yeah. Now you mentioned something there, and I'm going to talk on this later because I know it's something you help people with is, is pivoting. And, and we're going to talk about that because, you know, sometimes, sure. yeah, businesses need to pivot. And, and I think the fear is there as well. So we'll talk on that in a bit. But so let's talk about, you know, we, we talked uh, briefly about um, venture capitalists. So let's talk about that a little bit because one, A, I don't know, well, I don't want to make assumptions, but let's assume a lot of people don't know what a venture capitalist is, sure. what they can do for your business and, you know, why you may or why you may not want, you know, that help in your business. Can you, can you talk to sure. us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, so, so venture capital has been around for decades. Um, I believe, you know, someone may, may look this up, but I think it started, you know, in Northern California, in the Bay area in the early days with companies like Intel and Apple. And if you, if you and I go into business together, we want to start a, a restaurant or um, a light manufacturing business. There are businesses that have already walked that path. And so we, if we walk into a bank, you know, we can say, okay, look here, you know, here's the assumptions we're making. We're going to put it in this town, in this location. And someone can look at that and say, okay, that makes, that makes sense. And they'll decide to loan us money. And they already have a risk profile based on comps and comparables from other businesses. Right. Venture capital is, is, is kind of a, you know, a, a high risk investment. Now there's ways that you can mitigate that risk, but venture capital is set up largely for untested businesses, untested ideas. And so, you know, in the early days, you know, if, if, if you were Mark Andreessen and you were this kid coming out of the University of Illinois, you know, with an idea for for a, a web browser, well, who needed that? There, there was no right. market for right. it, right? Because there weren't people on the internet. And why would people get on the internet if Joe User didn't really have a way of being able to see what's there and like how many websites are there? So there wasn't a market. Venture capital exists to effectively fund those people with those ideas in the hope that it'll actually turn into a business. And, you know, there's different stages of it. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's gotten very uh, segmented uh, over the past couple of years. So if you have an idea, you're largely looking for uh, either friends and family or angel investors. And these <clears> are the people who really, they're investing in you as the entrepreneur or a group of people that are the entrepreneurs. Right. Uh, you know, then then you can move into pre-seed and seed funds, which are kind of, you know, the first, what, what often referred to as the institutional money coming in. And the way a venture firm works is they'll go out and they'll say, hey, look, we want to raise money. And, and the expectation, generally speaking, is they're going to 10x the money. Okay. So if they're going to raise a million dollars, they're going to return at least $10 million and 50 million and 10 million or 50 million, 100 million, so on and so forth. Now, where is that going to come from? Well, usually it's, it's a little bit of an 80, 20, oftentimes a 90, 10 rule, which is the outsized returns are going to come from one, two or three or a handful of companies in their portfolio of investments. Now, what a venture capitalist will do is, is, They'll say, okay, um, I'm looking for investors, and those investors are known as limited partners. All right. And they'll come in and they'll say, here's my thesis. Uh, you know, it's Reggie Eric, you know, VC fund. Our thesis is we invest in companies that um, are, are pre revenue, uh, they're in biotech, and they have these other characteristics. And we think, you know, Here's the trends we're seeing. Here's all the things. So you're convincing investors of a couple of things. One is that you have a certain insight and, and knowledge base of a particular industry to be able to spot trends that, you know, 5, 10, 15 years out will become big trends. Right. And that secondly, you can pick the people who will create businesses that will take advantage of those trends and those will become companies that you may invest a million dollars in today and they'll be, you know, your investment will be worth $30 million in five to 10 years. Very few, well, I wouldn't say very, not a lot of <clears throat> venture capitalists are generalists. So right. you know, I think one of the things young entrepreneurs is they just want to like spray and pray out there and <laughs> it doesn't do you any good. What, you yeah. know, really what you want to do is you, you're, you're looking for somebody who is one stage. 
Like, where are you? Like, are you just an idea or are you an idea that with a product and market generating revenue, or are you generating, you know, at least enough revenue that you're close to cash flow positive? You know, all those things will then start to segment the types of investors that you're looking for. Right. And then secondly, you know, what's the area? Well, if you're a SaaS business and you're talking to somebody who really only invests in in biotech or in, uh, you know, hardware type, type businesses, you know, th- even if they love your idea, you, you'll hear from investors sometimes say, look, I love this. And, and actually, I'm I'm kind of passionate about it. But yeah, I've gone to these limited partners. I've raised $50 million to go invest in these types of companies and this stage and in this profile. I can't, by, by the agreements that I've given to these limited partners who've given me their money to invest, I can't go invest in, in, in outside of that thesis. <clears throat> right, yeah. So venture capital is, is, is there to take that risk that a, a, a traditional institution like a bank or um, maybe more traditional investors, you know, can't or won't take knowing full well that a bunch of them won't work. Right. Okay. But it's not the matter of the, 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 the couple that either won't work and won't work actually means different things. Won't work might mean it hits a wall and you run out of money. It, it could mean you just have a nice little cash flow business. That's more of a lifestyle business which people will look at it and say, well, Reggie, you know, you, you raised $2 million. You sold your company for 20. Like, you know, will not these guys want to invest in you again? And the answer could be maybe not. Right. Which yeah. sounds crazy. But if if they're saying, hey, look, for people that we invested a million dollars in, we, we were expecting, you know, at least a $250 million liquidity event. Exit. Right. Yeah. Then that's a, like, it's a whole different thing, which is, you didn't fail by world standards, but you may have not aligned with their investment. The investment, lot. right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that makes sense. Now, do you find that venture capitalists tend to lean towards certain types of businesses? Like, is there, there's certain industries where, <laughs> and, and I know this was part of, you know, ec, ec, your, um, your business was to, to yeah. kind of bring it to mainstream small businesses, but do you find that venture capitalists seem to lean towards certain types of business? Well, you know, look, it, it, Twitter's a, 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 a good and a bad thing probably, but like, you know, if you, if you follow the trends on Twitter, I mean, a year ago it was all web three. Right. Right. Like just web three, web three, like, is this on the blockchain? And, and, you know, it, 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 there are trends that, that at some point become memes and those memes can be a bit comical. And so right now, if, if you're trying to raise money, you better have an AI angle. Right. And, yeah. And, you know, if you were, if you were sad, so um, I do think that there are trends that said, I think the good venture capitalists, who consistently can raise money and put that money to work and see returns can and do invest in what they know. And there is so much market opportunity out there and the internet has been such a democratization tool for getting, and we're not there yet. Like there's a whole lot of underrepresented founders and in and, and geographic locations and other things. So I'm, I'm thrilled that a lot of this stuff is starting to kind of expand well outside of Silicon Valley. But, um, you know, this is, you know, tip for an entrepreneur is you, you need to make sure that you're looking for the in, the investors that not only see your vision and invest in your area, but they have a deep domain expertise or some knowledge and network there that they can help you. Right. So it, it, it's a massive market. Um, I think there, there, there are, have been and always will be people who chase trends. Um, 2023 and probably into 2024, largely with ChatGPT and others. AI is the hot thing. Yeah. You know, we'll see what the hot thing, you know, in 21 and 22, it was, it was web three. Right. We'll see what it is in, in 2024 and 2025. Yeah. It's still AI. Maybe it's something else that, that, you know, will come to light. Right. Now, you know, before we move away from VCs, what, um, if you were to give somebody who, you know, has a business up and running and they, they kind of maybe want to expand, what advice would you give to somebody about approaching you know, a venture mm-hmm. capitalist, what, wh- how do you put your best foot forward? How do you get in a door? How do you even get them to, to you know, take a phone call or answer an email? Sure. Well, uh, the, the first advice I give every entrepreneur is, is this, uh, one, all money spends the same. Who you take money from matters and not just the brand on the door, but the person that's representing that brand. Right. And so, the question I like to ask, and I encourage other people, especially if you've never raised before and you're starting to see some interest and people are you know, leaning in, so to speak, 
is tell me about a problem or an issue one of your portfolio companies had and how you helped them get out of it. How, how did you help them solve it? All right. And the reason I ask that is when times are good, when you've just gotten your your, your new product launched, everybody on Twitter, you know, clap, yeah, yeah, and yeah. You got an article in TechCrunch, whatever it is. The it's easy to have people supporting you. They like your tweets. They yeah. like to repost your stuff. Like that, yeah. But things go wrong. They always do, and and you'll recover mostly. Yeah. The question is, is whether that investor is going to either go silent not be helpful or whether they're going to actually say, okay, take a deep breath. This is, we can, we can fix this. This is something we can address. I know somebody, I know how I've been down this road before. And so the first rule is make sure you're taking money from, from people and, and you know, are they, are they going to be one of three things? Are they going to be passive? That's okay. Yeah. But understand that. Don't expect them. So if, if they're there to write you a check for whatever it is, a half a million dollars and and they're not very helpful and they don't reply to your emails, just note that going in. Right. Two, there are some, and this is where it's good to ask other founders, people that they've invested in. You know, some can be toxic. Yeah. Law of averages, right? There's yeah. toxic people out there in every environment. So there are some investors who can be toxic. And those you obviously want to stay away from because – they can consume a lot of mental, emotional, and, and time, you know, bandwidth from you right. that can be detrimental to your company. And in some cases, I've seen it where it's driven a company, you know, off the rails. The third is, is are they going to be helpful? And that's that's kind of what you're looking for is, you know, you're passive, that's fine. You're, yeah. you're helpful, that, that, that's great. You're toxic, I'm going to avoid. Now, right. if, if you're, if you're going to go out and pitch, you know, there is at least a three to one ratio of research to outreach maybe it's too long right which is and it's not glamorous and there's different hacks and people have great insights i i, I don't know that i have a, a magic touch but building your target list is is it, you, you can't i can't stress enough how important it is for someone who says well i'm going to go out and start reaching out to vcs well who are you going to reach out to right and if the question is i'm just going to start like email you're like no no like that doesn't do it like pollutes their inbox. It makes you look like, yeah, you know spray and pray. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't help anyone. Um, you know, this isn't, you know, you're not the local lawn maintenance company that's just going to send, you know, right. A thousand mailers out to your neighborhood and, yeah. you know, 10, 5% of them will call you. So there are tools, there's signal from N NFX. There's other, uh, other tools that you know entrepreneurs can use that are free and it, it takes time and you should build your own list and ask for help from others, ask other people to review the list and know who you're talking to Right. before you start to send. Now, so I would say, you know, you build the list like by stage, by industry, previous investments they've done, reputation. Those are some basic criteria. Now, tailoring your message to them, um, I would say in the past three months, my, my view on this has changed. Um, a little bit. And there are AI tools that will allow you to help customize some of your emails. So right. really, don't ever make the mistake of, well, I'm going to out one, never outsource fundraising for an early stage funder. Just don't do it. And if someone tells you, pay me a couple thousand dollars, I'll go raise money for you. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. But there are tools that can help you understand how to tailor that message to that you know, partner or associate or principal at the VC firm. And again, you're not trying to have it write it for you, but what you want to do is you want to be able to tailor that message, which says, Hey, Reggie, you know, I see that you work at, you know, this particular fund. Um, I know you've made investments in this sector in the past that have done well. Here's what I'm doing. Be brief, cite data, show traction, and assume someone's going to spend three seconds before they're going to make a decision as to whether to read on Right. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And, and, you know, let, let, let's take it back to the, the, the sports analogy, right? I, I have a, a young son who will soon be looking to reach out to uh, coaches in football. And it's the exact same thing, right? Know your audience, know who you're talking to, yep. tar target the, the proper, you know, people who are, are there to do what you're looking to do. And with venture capitalists, if you need to help 
don't be sending out somebody who sits on the sidelines and just waits to to get the check coming in so um yeah so no that that's great um now you mentioned about you know businesses failing in that and so um what what have you seen you know through through the different businesses you've helped through you know possibly business of your own what do you see as some of the biggest reasons that uh you know startups fail yeah so so one thing that i tell you know first time entrepreneurs first time founders early entrepreneurs is uh, especially in my coaching practice i said look whatever mistake you've made i've made it or cleaned it up and it's been <laughs> bigger it's been messier right now there's probably going to be some exception to that but when they say like well we sent out this campaign to 10,000 users and I'm like oh yeah been there like we you know tried this thing and you know nine months of engineering time down the drain yep been there like so uh, this stuff happens and, yeah. and it gets back to that kind of resiliency which is you have to get you have to have a short memory right you just throw three interceptions in the first half all right well there's a second half of football to play like right. you know you're the quarterback like you know we got to keep passing so um the, the, but a couple of the mistakes I, I, I see um, are one, you know, building something before you go and you talk to customers, users, or whatever it may be. Right. And a hard truth to explain to somebody, especially if 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 somebody comes from an engineering product background, they have the capability of building something that's in their mind that they think will go to a need, and they'll talk to a handful of people, but that oftentimes is not enough. And so one of the hardest things I have had to tell a, a first time entrepreneur is no one cares if you can build something, right? You just don't get credit for it. Um, there, there's a chance that you got it right in the first time, but you know, I mean, it's like saying, well, I won the lottery and therefore, you know, I'm a numbers genius. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it, it just, it doesn't work that way. So, you know, it, it kind of back to the, the, the fundraising, you know, topic you know, it's that preparation of going and building a targeted list. If it's, Hey, look, I don't have 200 people, but I've got 50 people that are like right smack dab Yeah, who I want to talk to. I know why I want to talk to them, why they want to talk to me before you build that, you know, you want that negative feedback. You want people telling you, well, okay, what is it? But, but, but more importantly, like you're not looking for the negative, but it, it you know, you're either solving a problem or you're creating an opportunity. And so, you know, understanding you know, how they go about it. So, you know, with exit guide, we'll talk more about that later, but yeah. you know, I get asked the question like, well, how do small business owners go about this today? How do they do it today? And I had to spend a lot of time talking to small business owners who either were in the process or hadn't even thought about, or had exited a small business. How did it work? What did you do? What right. was a pain in the ass for you? Like, <laughs> yeah. What are all the, like, what did you wish you had? And sometimes they don't know. So, you know, be a little bit, uh, um, structure is how you have the conversation, which is something I struggle with. Cause I like I, I love having the conversation with the end user or the customer. Right. Did I ask the same five or 10 questions? So I could then kind of look at the answers and say, okay, well, I talked to 50 people and here's how they answered this one. And the second one, you know, so have some methodology as to how you go about that. But one, no one cares if you can build something. They care if you can build something that people, you know, need and are willing to pay for. Right. And so, you know, I've got this thing. Okay, great. Is it something people want or need? The old, is it, is it, you know, aspirin or a vitamin? Like, yeah. You know, yeah. vitamin, you stop taking it for a week. Like, eh. but if you've got a splitting headache and someone's holding that aspirin, like you damn well, like <laughs> yeah, $30 for that aspirin, like, okay. Exactly. Uh, and so, you know, that, that, you know, making sure you're building something that leads to a business Two is, is, you know, you are running a business. And so eventually, you know, you need to understand some of the mechanics of how your financials work. I, I, I'm not asking people to come in and, and become an expert um, and, and spend all their time in the books and in the financials. That's oftentimes not where a, a founder and a CEO needs to be. Right. But you need to have some basics of the working mechanics because the things that can get away from you without understanding that are just your, your operating expenses, your customer acquisition costs. Yeah. You know, is money leaking out the door in terms of, you know, how you're spending it, you know, on, on office space and other things. And when you go from being a relatively small business with you and your buddy or two or three or four people to suddenly having, you know, responsibility 30, 40, 50, 100 people or more, those operating, you know, 
metrics and where the money is flowing in and out, you know, where there's a, where there's a leak, it gets magnified. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, you know, talk, talk, you know, if you've got an idea, you know, make sure you understand the problem, um, you know, find ways. I, I, I joined the local chamber of commerce here, right? Not because I think that, that they're going to become customers of my product. Um, but, but, you know, when I get other benefits, I meet people, I learn about my community. There's absolutely a huge proponent. Like if you want to find something that's good for you, good for your business, you want to learn about your local community, go join your local chamber of commerce. But the yeah. other is just being with people who are my target customers and not even talking about my business. It sheds light into these nuances of how they think about their business. How do right. they approach that business? You know, what are their big concerns and fears? So make sure you understand your customer. Always keep an eye on on, on the financials because you are building a business. If you're taking money from investors, even more so because they're going to start asking you some detailed questions. Oh, and yes. You simply can't pass the buck. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. Uh, and I always tell, you know, my clients too, if you can't balance your home uh, um, checks, you know, if you can't keep a budget at home, if you can't balance yeah. your checkbook, probably don't. Yeah jump into business you know I'm, especially I'm with a couple of messes right partners or investors yeah yeah. Thought, oh my gosh yeah <laughs> yeah and it you know it, i i love how you said you know what test the market find out if there's even a need or a want um i, I had a guest on who did exactly that and and she had a bit of a list and, and she sent out and said listen you know what thinking about doing this course uh starting sure. in a couple of weeks would you be interested well, she got an overwhelming response to, oh, yes. And it's like, oh, shit, now what? <laughs> you know, I told these people we can do this. Um, but it's kind of like, well, now your feet are held to the fire. So, you know what? But at least you know that you're not wasting your time. Um, and, you what know, one great problem for her to go solve. Exactly. Yeah. And one thing she said as well, too, is, is it kept her from. You know, a, a lot of people, and I don't know if you offer courses or stuff, but a lot of people will spend a lot of time, and I'm guilty of this myself, developing the course from A to Z. Everything's got to be perfect. And she said, I did one week at a time because I could focus yeah. all my energy on perfecting that sure. one week and then shit, now I got to get week two week ready because everybody's waiting. And it keeps yeah. you, you know, it keeps you on point, I guess, and to make sure you're putting out quality, not quantity. So, um, so yeah, I love that. Um, and it was a feedback. My guess is it was a, it was a feedback loop for her. What she learned after doing week one helped inform her for week two. Oh, absolutely. Two weeks helped inform week three and so forth. Yeah. So, you know, one of the other things, I mean, this is just a little bit of an aside, but sometimes I'll see people that are raising their first, you know, bit of money and they'll be like, well, you know, my investor, you know, potential investor is asking for five-year projections. Right. Well, you know, if, if if it's a restaurant or if it's something that's a traditional business, maybe that makes sense. But if you're building something that, you know, doesn't exist in the market today yeah. and, you know, you're an early team and early, like, that's kind of a ridiculous question right. or a request from the investor. And it doesn't mean, I don't mean to say that that reflects poorly on the investor, but it may reflect that they don't understand necessarily the type of yes. investment they're about to make, yeah. which is what you know today is going to be you know, very different than what you're going to know in six months, much right. less two years. So how do you predict where you're going to be in year two, much less year four? So, right. Yeah. You know, these things generally in, in my end of the entrepreneurship side of, you know, early technology, untested markets and venture capital, you know, you have to have a level of fluidity. Yes. You need that long-term vision, but then operationally, you know, you kind of have to say, look, I'm, I'm, continue looking for this feedback loop right and that too can kind of show you that maybe that venture capitalist isn't well versed in startups and because they, they would know that you know what yeah that's kind of a hard question to ask so you know we can we can make some assumptions but compared to somebody who's you know used to investing in in traditional type businesses where you can see kind yes. of the ebbs and flows and things like that so um, so okay, so let's let's dive into exit guide. Let's let's get into sure. talking about mergers and acquisitions of small business. Yeah. And I think I think you focus around the five million mark. If I if I'm um, below the really small below five million, business. right? Yeah. Yep. So let's talk about that because I had mentioned to you before. You know, when when you watch TV, when you read the newspaper, whatever, when you're hearing mergers and acquisitions, it's it's big companies. It's you know the Yahoo's buying out the little guys and, and you know swallowing up all the little people. And sure. it's big companies. You don't hear it about 
small company. So I'd like to, to, you know, I was interested in learning a little bit more sure. about that. And, and like I said to you as well, you know, developing an exit plan. Any business I've started, I've never thought about, okay, well, how am I getting, how the hell am I getting out of this? <laughs> you know? Yeah, It's just not yeah. something as an entrepreneur because, but I guess I can p- compare it. And I don't, I think you got a couple of kids, Eric, but I, I've always called, you know, my business is my baby. It's my third child, fourth child, fifth child, whatever. And, mm-hmm. But there comes a point too when you want to see those damn kids leave. So maybe getting rid of the business at some point is kind of kind of up there with seeing those kids leave the damn house. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Right. So maybe That's there right. needs to be an exit plan for every business. Yeah. I need to think a little more on that. But um, but let's talk about you know mergers, acquisitions, and developing sure. an exit plan. So so the, the the last couple of years that that I lived in in Silicon Valley about seventeen years before moving to Austin, and. I, I, you know, there, there, I believe there's a, for, for some people, your career can, can kind of represent a Venn diagram of, of one circle is willing and the other circle is able. I think some people, you know, just how did you get there? Be like, well, I, I, I went into this opportunity and quite frankly, I was both willing and I was able to, to do it. Right. And so I find my, found myself um, working with about five or six different venture capital back companies um, where the, the, Things were not going according to plan. Now, some of these had raised as little as you know three or four million, and some had raised as much as seventy million dollars. And my job, you know, came you know generally I was contacted by one of the investors, board member, and said you know here's the situation. Um, we're not sure exactly what we're going to do. You know, do we put more money in? Do we restructure? Is this how, what, what's the deal? So I would get brought in. And, and through that, I did a couple of, of turnarounds. I did some asset purchase agreements. I, I helped, you know, sell companies, you know, and so I learned these mechanics. And, and one, you know, my, my, my kind of flippant way of, of saying that is, I, 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 and this is true, and I don't mean this to be uh, negative, but I, I kind of grew tired of cleaning up messes for millionaires. Right. right as I yeah. like to say, right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, but, but I learned these mechanics in, in, you know, the other thing that, that, you know, I, I, I had was, was, okay, look, I don't want to do this anymore, but what do I do with this skill set? And this, this, this is a true story. Um, sometimes, you know, startup stories have, have, have their lore and, you know, you find out later, they're like, oh yeah, we made that up. Like right. our person, like yeah. three years after starting it, <laughs> said like, didn't you two meet at a, you know, right. uh, I was in the car and I, I heard the story come on the radio about small business owners that are baby boomers that were aging out of their business and they were struggling as to, to what to do. Yeah. For whatever reason, I thought it was odd. And and I did a whole bunch of digging it and I realized a couple of, of things. One is, you know, most small businesses in North America are really small. Right. So, so they are small Main Street businesses. They have revenue generally under $2 million a year. And this represents about 90% of small businesses. Yeah. So, you know, one, it, it, you know, when they're ready to exit, access to bankers, MA advisors, even business brokers and good attorneys, it, it just, it, it's out of reach. Like the, just the economics aren't there. You know, a broker does, why would you go take, you know, a commission on a selling a $600,000 business when you can go sell a business worth 15 or $20 million? Right. Like, doing the same amount of work, you're taking yeah. 10, 12%, like you may as well. Uh, two, you know, taking my own experience of living in Silicon Valley, I, you know, look, if I didn't, if I didn't have somebody that was on the team of a company I was, I was working in or outside counsel, I lived in the middle of a nice part of a fluent part of Silicon Valley. So you know, it could be the, you know, buddy from church. It could be my, you know, kids, friends, mom, like, I had access to people that could give me advice and counsel for a cup of coffee. Right. And so when I started to look at small business, I realized you have a lot of small businesses that generally are about 30 to 35% of the total GDP. And these are people with real businesses. They're putting food on the table. They're, they're putting a roof over the heads of their yeah. family. And the steps they can take to do business formation online, such as should I you know, be this type of entity or that type of entity and running the business. When it comes to like, okay, well, I need to want to, and thinking about, have to exit my business. Well, all the people who can help you are too expensive. Right. 
And I, I said, well, maybe the problem exists before people are ready to sell. Maybe people are like, I don't even know what to do. Yeah, yeah. And so what we do is, well, one of the, the other things that I learned is, you know, we, about 45% of small business owners that plan to exit are going to sell to someone that they know. Right. So it's a business partner, it's a family yeah. member or an employee. Employee, yeah. They're not looking for a buyer. In fact, you know, one of the, the survey you know, questions we have is, well, what's your biggest concern when it comes to exiting? 65% of small business owners, this is from thousands of people that have taken a survey, 65%, their biggest concern is with the process. Where right. do I start? What do I do? What is this going to cost? I don't right. even know. Like I, I've been running this thing for two, three, five, 10, 15 years. And this, this next step in, in the transition of my business is just so foreign to me. And I'm not even sure what to do. Versus yeah. 23% report their biggest concern is finding a buyer. All right. Okay. Yeah. So what we start with really is, is okay. Every, every business owner wants to come in and say, well, what's my business worth? Now, there are times where having a real professional look at actual financials is is necessary. What we provide is a kind of lightweight pricing guidance tool. Right. So people give us, you know, some financial information. They tell us other things about their exit. And we come back and we say, your business is worth between X and Y. So oftentimes these are businesses worth typically 250000 in value to about two to two and a half million in value. Okay. And then from there, what we're what we're seeking to do is you know, kind of move past this education process, which is okay. I started with, okay, start with what's my business worth. I kind of have an idea of what it's worth. I've read some content, watched some videos and exit guide, kind of have an idea of how this process works and what my options are, the difference between selling to an employee versus find a buyer. Okay. Like got it. Then we want to help them prepare. And, and so we're, we're giving them online tools that will help them kind of package up the business. Right. And get organized for due diligence. And so again, they're they're like I I like how do I even start? So what we want to give them is the ability to say, look, if you need to present the business to your employee who make maybe they're taking it to a bank for an SBA loan, or yeah. maybe they're taking it to you know their attorney or to their their spouse, whatever, right? Yeah. Um, or maybe you need to you know you're going to send this out to ten people in your community who who might be interested. You want to put something forward that is professional looking. So in our parlance, we call it a prospectus. We call it an assessment report. It's two hundred bucks. They kind of you know, fill out a little bit of information. We do all the heavy lifting. We make it look good so they can present their business. All right. The other piece is coaching. And and that's where a lot of times, you know, we're, we tactically are solving for, okay, you got to have a little bit of a way to market your business. You got to have these tools and valuation. The other thing, but coaching oftentimes is, is, you know, a lot of it is around fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Yeah. I've got a print shop in, you know, you know, Ontario, or I've got a, a, you know, a, you know, a, a restaurant in Buffalo, like, what do like, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm concerned. Right. And so they can sign, they can, they can pay for a coaching session. We want off. And so what we're doing is we're kind of starting with the education that's for free. We want people to be informed because, you know, 85 to 90% of small business owners for small main street businesses, they have no plan. Right. No. To exit the business, just as you said. Yeah. And so we want to get them comfortable that like, okay, we got you. Like we're gonna we're gonna give you at least some information. You don't have to become an M and A expert. That's what we're here for. Right. But these are basically straightforward transactions, and we're gonna get you educated. We're gonna help you, you know, prepare. If you need to engage a couple buyers, then we're gonna help you with that. And then eventually, when they're ready to exit, and they're like, "Okay, I'm gonna sell my business to Reggie. He's been my employee for the past three years, or you know, to Joe in my community." Yeah. Then we you know, have a, a, a new service we've rolled out where we'll help manage that transaction to close by providing the coaching, the legal support and the other things. And we'll get that, you know, that transaction done for you. So we're not seeking to match buyers and sellers. I think other people do that and can do that, you know, reasonably well. Right. But we find that about 70, 80% of the market is actually looking for something other than help me go find a potential buyer. Right. And so we're trying to address that massive need. Yeah, no. And I, I agree. I, I, think it is a massive need i've known business you know owners who and, and i think a lot of times when you have family business you just make the assumption yeah. that you know one of my kids is going to step in and 
and you know lo and behold your kid really hates drywalling <laughs> or you know yeah, cooking yeah. in the in the restaurant or, or whatever sure. it is they just did it because well mom and dad kind of said i had to or i wanted to make some summer money or whatever and then you spent you know 20 30 years building something and then it's like well you know might as well put a close sign on the door because i have no idea what to do so yeah. um and that's an unfortunate thing, right? Yeah, like, absolutely. I hear those stories. You're right, yeah. I hear those stories, and it pains me to hear that. And a lot of family businesses don't get passed on to the next generation. All right. Um, especially when you see, um, you know, first and second generation immigrant families. Like, they came here, or, you know, a family started a business, and, and part of what motivated I, I we had, you know, a story from from a, from a successful restaurateur um, Gulf Gulf uh, Coast of, of Texas. And, you know, he took the business over from his father-in-law. And, and what he said to me during a coaching session, he said, we raised our kids not to be in the restaurant business. Right. Because they, they you know, he and his wife had viewed this as like, this is, and it is, right? This is hard work. Oh, it is. I've been there. I had a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. You got to yeah, love right? it. You <laughs> have to love it. Yeah. Yeah. And and so, you know, in some cases, the kid doesn't want it. But in other cases, the parents' dream is actually to not have the kid. To, right be at the restaurant in the kitchen at one o'clock in the morning or be behind that, 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 the, 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 the counter at the dry cleaner. Yeah. And these are all amazing businesses. I have, I have unbelievable respect, you know, but you know, in some cases, a lot of people um, are not prepared for this. And you look at the demographics, uh, 85% of businesses in North America are owned by Gen X and baby boomers. And baby boomers. Right. Yep. So, so the youngest Gen X is what, 45, 46, yeah. you know, and the youngest, uh, uh, baby boomer is, is like, you know, 60. So the question becomes what's going to happen with all these and to assume that they're all going to post something online and, and kind of find this magical buyer and it's right. going to carry on. It's just, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense. The logic breaks down. So, right. You know, you've got a whole bunch of them that 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 kind of say like, I, you know, look, whether it's the best transaction or not, I, I want to sell this to my, 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 you know, my cousin, my employee, you know, a competitor, mem you know, could be my business partner who's a bit younger wants to buy me out. There's we we need to enable those transactions. There's a whole bunch of people who just, quite frankly, they need some information and a little bit of coaching for what to do. And then there's other people who, you know, if you kind of help them, they will go find that buyer in their local community because these tend to be hyper-local businesses. Yeah. So we want to enable that too. But I, I truly believe like part of part of our mission is to head off a potential, you know, economic crisis. Absolutely. Um, you know, that that is, is is just simply due to demographics. Like we just have a, a whole bunch of people over the age of 55 that own a whole lot of small businesses and we got to figure out, you know, how to help them you know, pass it on, or, or in some cases, maybe to sell the assets and, and close it. Yeah. But that's still a plan. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, when you talk demographics, as we, we see a real change in the demographics as to what the younger generation, you know, wants out of their lives. And, and you know, the, I think the onslaught of social media and stuff like that has really changed. I mean, you can see it, and you know, I'm, I'm sure it's the same uh, where you are, where the trades are, are, you know, struggling to bring people in, you know, oh, the younger generations, goodness. because, you know, that's yes. not what the, the new generation wants to do, right? They, they want to be, you know, whether it's TikTok famous or YouTube stars or whatever, yeah. right? And yeah, I think, unfortunately, like you say, we're going to see, you know, an economic downturn where all these mom and pop shops that have, like you said, yes. put, put food on the table, kept a roof over your head, put you through school and all these things. Is it glamorous? No. And, and most entrepreneurial businesses aren't, uh, you know, they're not. I don't know too many people who, you know, think cutting the grass is glamorous, but I know a lot of people who make the damn good living by doing so. And I think that's like you say, you know, it's going to be the unfortunate thing where you may see, yeah, more, you know, asset sell off than, than passing on a business. And that's unfortunate. If, if, if anyone listening to this podcast is under 30 and especially if you're under 25, right. I'll tell you that my kids are 22 and 24 and one actually is in university. She's over in the UK. The other did not go to university and he's an electrician apprentice. And I'll tell the same thing I told my kids as well as I'll tell, tell, tell younger people. Look, I, I've had a very fortunate career in the internet space and I kind of 
right place, right time. I was there when it all. Right. Yeah. Out. Yeah. If you want to almost with that, the, I, I can say that you want to find the highest probability of becoming a millionaire. Go learn a skilled trade. Absolutely. Become an apprentice. Find a business that you can work in and eventually take over. Yeah. There are loads of plumbers, electricians, oh, yeah. landscape companies, yeah. um, restaurant owners that, that are running good cash flow businesses yeah. that will exit in the seven figures, sometimes eight figures. Yeah. And is it glamorous? No. But if you can, you know, if you can take a, a, a you know, commercial or residential electrician, uh, you know, electrician company and, and, you know, run that for 10 years and 15 years and grow that. Yeah. You know, AI is not going to replace electricians. No, no, it's exactly. Replace frontline software engineers and content marketers and others. I, you know, I think that's a real possibility. Yeah. If I were coming out of school, what would I know? If I, if I were coming out of school or if I were 22 years old, knowing what I know now in, in there, and I was given the opportunity to, you know, go work at a, a, a 300 person, you know, SaaS company as a, a junior marketer or go learn a trade. Yeah. Wouldn't even think twice. I'd go learn that trade hands down every day, twice on Sunday, because those businesses, again, as you start to see people that are getting older, pipes are going to break. Things are going to need to be rewiring. Our population is going to continue to grow. So Absolutely. that means expansion of these. So all these, all these main street businesses you know, are, are just great businesses to be in and you will have the opportunity to learn the mechanics of running a business if you give it some time. So huge yeah. supporter of the trades. We should do more to, to incentivize young people to get in there and really view these as, as the important jobs that they are. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I'm going to segue off of that where we're kind of talking about, you know, coming out of school, you, you would make a pivot and I know you help businesses decide whether mm -hmm. they should pivot or not. So, yeah. you know, I I'm, I'm, want to wrap things up here shortly, but sure. let's talk about that because, you know, too often as entrepreneurs, we get an idea in our mind and we get the blinders on and, yeah. you know, we'll run into that same freaking wall five, six, eight times. And, and like you say, yeah. we're watching the numbers, but the numbers are going down. They're not going up. Sure. When is it you think, or what kind of advice would you give to people to say, listen, you know what? A, there's nothing wrong with pivoting. Uh, you know, you yeah. and I talked, I, I pivoted this damn podcast, you know, when I started out, I thought I'm going to do sure. one thing, but I pivoted yeah. it and you know, it, it's benefited me. But when should you decide that? Yeah. You know what? No, it's just a hump. Keep going. Or you know what? Yeah. This is you're you're beating a dead horse time to do something different. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the the question I will ask founders oftentimes um, the early of conversation, you know, you like to you know tell me about how you got here and you want to understand the journey. You know, how did they get to where they are? Um, why did you start this? But, you know, one question to ask yourself is, are you in love with your idea or are you in love with the opportunity? Right. Because if you're in love with your idea, then you better hope you're right. Yeah. And, and, and if you're right, awesome, stick with it. If you're in love with the opportunity, well, then maybe your current idea needs to change and maybe it, you know, needs some influence. Maybe it needs a whole re reset, but you're still focused on the opportunity. My mission in life is to, to you know, democratize the M&A process for the masses. Right. I believe that that, that M&A to date has largely been you know, smart, highly paid individuals have only been able to serve service about, you know, three to 5% of the industry. Yeah. And I think there's kind of some room between that's still going to require people, but not as much. And then I think there's a whole bunch of stuff that technology is going to have to enable And my mission in life is to go do that. Do I have it right today? I, I you know, I think we're, we're, we're on the right path. I don't think we've got all the, the, the thing, the things that we want to figure out, figure it out, figure it out, but I'm in love with the opportunity. And if someone came in and said, look, you need to reset on how you're approaching this, you know, let's retool your pricing, whatever it may be. I'm cool with that. Yeah. Uh, at least I like to think that. Now, maybe that day will come <laughs> <Yeah>. in. <laughs> and I'll be like, you never pivoted. You should have. That's right. Yeah. But, 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 you know, if you're in love with the, the, the opportunity, and it, if you can be honest with yourself about that question and say, okay, you know, and I think a lot of people do start, I'm in love with my idea, I'm in love with the way I'm doing it. Right. Right. Then, then that is hard. If you're in love with the opportunity, uh, you know, then then one of the things 
that, that you can do or that I've helped do, which is let's just talk through, let's not talk about what's what's wrong. Like, let's forget about that for a minute. Like we don't, we're, we've, we're not going to decide yet as to what's wrong and what's right. I mean, other than like, Hey, look, man, you're, you're upside down in your customer acquisition. I mean, if there's glaring things that you can look at and point to that somebody has missed, which yeah. happens, I mean, yeah. I've had come in and, you know, I've said many times, like I've had clients where you walk in and you feel like, a, you know, you're crystallizing the obvious by saying, well, you, you're selling dollars for 70 cents. Like right. your revenue has gone up, but like, this is just not sustainable. But if you're in love with the opportunity, then find more than two, but probably no more than 10 people that you trust that know you and understand at least enough of your business and, and, and start getting some input and start, you know, just what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to start thinking about how you're addressing that opportunity. And so, you know, yeah, someone like me, you can pay, I can come in, I can help you with that. I've got expertise, I've got pattern recognition. And if you're going to hire a coach, you know, uh, what I like to tell people is, look, you know, you, you need to have the right, like, you kind of have to be on the same wavelength. Sometimes it's, it is, it's just a personality fit. Like, it's yeah. just somebody that you vibe with. Like, that's, that's more than 50% of it. Uh, but the other part is, you know, if someone's just selling a process or are they selling, you know, wisdom? And so that wisdom comes from pattern recognition, which is we all have it, whether it's, you know, you know, looking at art or seeing a certain piece of art or whatever. Like you just have this, you've seen it so many times, Mal Malcolm Gladwell is famous for writing on this. You can just be like, well, you got to, you know, make that page blue or you've got to change this widget to, you know, being 20% more and perceive that, whatever it may be. Yeah. But if you're, if you're looking, if you're in love with the opportunity, then that does free you to rethink how you're approaching your business, whether that's product, marketing, operations, a little bit of all those. And fall in love with the opportunity, fall in love with the problem set, fall in love with, with what it is, and, and, and allow yourself to rethink your approach. And so if your approach is not working, that may be okay. Right. Now, if you're no longer in love with the opportunity, or you believe that opportunity is smaller, different, just ambiguous to you now, then it is time to rethink, is this something that I no longer want to pursue? Right. Yeah. And I had a friend that, that asked me this, you know, um, it, at one point, and I, I think he framed it so well. He said, do you still feel a need to see this in the world? And if, if it's, you know, if you're running a food truck and it's that kind of special way that you make a sandwich or, you know, you're trying to do a, a tech startup or you're trying to run a business or an accounting firm, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. if you still feel like the, the thing that you're trying to deliver needs, needs to exist, then you're still in love with the opportunity. It just may take a different path. And so, you know, pivots can be a, a, an overused term that means different things to different people. Right. But it really is about assessing, like, are you still passionate about going after that opportunity? And is that opportunity worth going after? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And I love that, you know, are you in love with the opportunity or the idea? Because, you know, and I can't think of a better analogy, but there's a saying, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And I don't know if that's a great one to use if you're a cat lover, but <laughs> a dog guy, so yeah, okay. me, me yeah. too. Uh, but you know, it, it's true, right? Like you, you can still get to where you want to be. It just not, might not be down the, the road you thought you were going to go and, and sure. that's okay. And, and I think, you know, for entrepreneurs, we, we need to love the opportunity, not the idea. I, I really like that. And I like how you, you yeah, said it that. Is. And so. I'll close with this. This is one thing. And this is a bit of a life verse for me. Yeah. And it's a Yiddish proverb. And I love it. And, in, in, you know, I've involved my church. And I love the fact that this is a, a Yiddish proverb. Right. If you want to make God laugh, just tell him your plans. Right. <laughs> yes. So, you know, sometimes we don't have those answers. And it's okay to be deep into the struggle. If you're impassioned about, you know, solving this, this problem or bringing this thing to market or the opportunity, then don't get locked up in your own plan and pathway for that. You know, be open, whether it's to the universe or to your faith or to the market, whatever it may be, that'll help you unlock that. Allow yourself that freedom to kind of say, maybe I need to approach this with a different perspective or a different angle and find ways, whether it's talking to people or whether it's taking a break for a weekend or changing your environment or go camping, walk in the woods, do something. Yeah. Just do some, take some form of proactive action that will change your perspective and hit the brick reset button on your brain. Right. 
That's great. Well, listen, Eric, you know what? I've taken lots of your time and I appreciate uh, you coming on on the show. Um, If people want to learn more, you know, about you, about Exit Guide, where can they find you? Sure. So uh, there's ExitGuide.com. That's the business. Yeah. Um, And if you're a small business owner and you just want to learn about the pathway to exit, you can just start there for free. Um, I also do coaching. So it's ericgrafstrom.com and that's E-R-I-C. And then Grastrom, if if you have any Scandinavians out there, they're going to know how to spell this, <laughs> but I'll spell it for the rest. But it's G-R-A-F, like Frank, and then Strum. So it's ericgrafstrom.com. Uh, not a whole lot of people out there, if you Google Eric Grafstrom, like probably some guy in Stockholm or right. something show up <laughs> yeah. in the So uh, it, it, this isn't a, this isn't a, a big push. Um, but I love talking to entrepreneurs. I love to give back. So many people help me along the way. I am that scrappy kid from the Midwest with a journalism degree who managed to find his way into, you know, a lot of boardrooms and interesting opportunities in Silicon Valley and then some. Uh, if I can do it, you can. I know I'm not the uh, the smartest guy out there, but, um, you know, I was willing to to, to kind of so like so, uh, leave everyone with this. I was smart enough to get in the room and dumb enough to realize I probably shouldn't be there. All right. That's great. And, you know, I'll be putting those links in the show notes. And, uh, you know, Eric, you, Thank you. you you said that, you know, you were you found your way into boardrooms, but I hear you can't find yourself into a squash court in Austin. I know. It's You're true. having a hard and time I, there. <laughs> I am. I am. That's my big plan. People are like, I'm not a watch guy, car guy, clothes guy. So, yeah, that's my big plan. If I, if I make a kajillion dollars, yeah. uh, I'm going to open a squash court in Austin, and the membership is going to be super exclusive. I have to like you, and you have to be a nice person. Right. Yeah. Uh, like, if you're a jerk and you're an amazing squash player, like, no. Yeah. You can't come in. And uh, I'll be looking for a whole bunch of mediocre squash players who are nice people and just want to go out and hang out and bat the little right. around. So Th- I'd love awesome. to do that. But if there's any rich people in Austin listening to this around building a squash court, <laughs> like I'm totally your guy, please reach out to me. That's awesome. Okay, well, listen, we're going to wrap this up. You know, Eric left right. you with Thank a you, Yiddish man. proverb. I'm going to leave you with what with I call the golden nugget. I, I do all, you know, the end of my shows with this. And, and you know, we talked about, you know, if, if you're a certain age, well, you may not know what these are, but life is like monkey bars, right? And you probably got to be, you know, older than 40 to know what the hell a monkey bar is because I think they're outlawed in most places, most provinces, most states because you might get hurt. But life is like monkey bars. You know, eventually you have to let go to move forward. And once you make the decision to leap into entrepreneurship, be sure to loosen your grasp on old concepts. And we just kind of talked about this, right? So you can swing your way to new ones. Letting go and taking risks can be scary, right? And entrepreneurship is not, you know, for the faint of heart, but progress creates momentum and success in business and in life is all about growth. And growth tends to feel a little scary at first, but once you get into it, you learn to love it. Listen, Entrepreneur Nation, I want to thank you on behalf of Eric, on behalf of myself, for letting us into your homes, letting us into your car, your business, wherever it is you're listening right now. I appreciate you taking the time. As you know, I'm taking this journey with you. I want to see you succeed. Guests like Eric, you know, we want to see you succeed because everybody deserves, you know, to become the best they be. Or as you know, as I put it, continue going out there and becoming that legend you know you're destined to be. Talk to you soon.